1985. World champion Anatoly Karpov arrives at the Tchaikovsky Hall for Game 16 of the World Chess Championship. Shortly after his challenger arrives, 22-year-old Gary Kasparov. 1,500 spectators are anxiously awaiting the start of this game. Outside Tchaikovsky Hall, thousands of people are trying to get in. Tickets to this event were being sold on the black market for anywhere between 2 and 15 rubles. Translated to today's currency, that is between 100 and 600 dollars for watching this single game. This is 1985, Moscow, Soviet Union. These were poor people. They really wanted to see this game. The match was tied at seven and a half and seven and a half for each player. If 34 year old Anatoly Karpov can draw the match by the rules of FIDE, he will retain his World Chess Championship title. And in this game, he has the white pieces. He opens up with pawn to e4. Back in 85, Karpov with the white pieces played e4 and said, I win. For 10 years, he had completely dominated the world of chess. He played e4 with the white pieces and tortured his opponents mercilessly until they crumbled like dust before his eyes. And with black, he would just draw every game, winning almost all tournaments he participated in comfortably. But now he is facing c5 by 22-year-old Gary Kasparov. And this game is one for the ages. Knight to f3 and e6. This game has it all, folks. Queen sacrifices, battles of ideas, the young upstart challenging the positional solid genius of the old school. And it has an impossible move. Here, Anatoly Karpov played d4. This will turn the game into an open Sicilian. What we are looking at right now is the opening phase of the game. In the opening phase of the game, we will draw up the battle lines. We will create the map on which this epic battle will take place. And in the words of Sun Tzu, he who chooses the battlefield wins the war. So they are jockeying for position, trying to get a strategical concept that they are comfortable with. Chess grandmasters spend enormous amounts of time studying all the different openings in chess and studying specifically those of their most feared opponents. Why? Because chess is a battle of ideas. And if you can forcefully insert your own idea and draw the map of the battlefield the way that you want it to be drawn to what is comfortable for you, you will have a huge advantage. And we will see that jockeying for position in this very game in a beautiful, beautiful manner. Now, in the open Sicilian, black captures the pawn on d4. which is immediately recaptured with the knight. Now, let's talk a little bit about the knights. You can see that for this game, I have oriented them so that they are facing towards the royalty. Sometimes I will orient them to face the opponent's king in order to show their intent. We are coming for you, is what they are saying. But I will orient them back towards the royalty because in this way you can see which knight comes from which square and that will be quite interesting later on knight to f6 and here this interesting knight b5 what is this move about 
why is Karpov moving this night so many times? It is about a very, very specific strategy, an opening strategy called the Maroxi bind. First, this knight is looking at d6. If it is allowed to, it will come to d6. That will be checked. The only even slightly acceptable move will be bishop takes and then queen takes and then black will have lost an extremely important piece. The exchange of knight for dark squared bishop in this opening is very beneficial to white. Therefore, d6 by black. This maneuver allows Karpov to now play c4. And let's pause for a moment and understand what this is about. c4 attacks d5 e4 attacks d5 the queen attacks d5 therefore white has created a bind on d5 saying i control this all-important square in black's side of the board i am therefore willing to in quotation marks waste time moving this knight so many times because i have a positional advantage this strategy was developed by Giza Moroxi almost 100 years before. And Giza Moroxi was one of the first grand masters of chess, and his name will come up again later in this video. Knight to f6. Normal developing move. This is known as the hedgehog structure. Knight on f6 attacks e4, therefore knight c3 defending e4 and here it comes the first part of what is going to be an absolutely mind-blowing game pawn to a6 attacking the knight this knight that has moved so many times it will have to move again going back to d4 is not an option knight takes knight queen takes knight and white will have lost their edge. Therefore, knight to a3. You can see these two knights are looking in opposite directions of each other compared to these two knights who maintain eye contact. Some months before this game, young Gary Kasparov had sat on a plane on his way to Baku playing with a small traveling chess set. And he had looked in this position and said, I mean, for 100 years, can it really be that nobody figured out a way to break the Maroxi bind? Is it really impossible? And also, does the old geezer Maroxi have some other tricks up in his sleeve that I can draw upon? And he came up with an idea that I can only do justice by showing you why spend all this time controlling d5 so that black can never play d5 and what Kasparov did in this situation was he played d5 the audacity of this move cannot be understated first of all he had tried it against Karpov once before in game 12 Karpov was a little rattled at this new idea so he played conservatively and made a quick draw obviously went home studied it and came up with a better way to combat this idea so not only is this not even a surprise for Karpov it is also challenging about 100 years of established chess theory because this gives up a pawn for seemingly no advantage whatsoever in the analysis room, grandmasters were slamming down their fists, saying this cannot be. He cannot do this. It is impossible. There is just no way that this is a sound chess move. And Karpov played C takes D. E takes D by Kasparov. E takes D by Karpov. And you're not going to capture that pawn. 
it is defended by the knight, it is defended by the queen. You only have two attackers, two defenders, that is advantageous to the defender. Knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, oops, you lose your queen. So why? What is this about? Knight b4, attacking the pawn, and now it's time to revisit that old geezer Maroxi. Some hundred years before, he had come up with a different idea. We will return to this position shortly, but let me show you something else. We reset the board, and I'm about to show you my favorite opening for black. If you are a long-time follower of the channel, you will know that I absolutely love to play with the black pieces. d4, knight f6, c4, e5, the Budapest defense. So named because it was first played by Gisa Moroxi, who was from Hungary and lived in Budapest. This game bit invented by Gisa Moroxi goes as follows. D takes E, giving up the pawn, knight G4. Knight F3, defending the pawn from the knight. This is known as the Adler variation, and that is how it went the very first time this gambit was played. Now, bishop C5, coordinating an attack with the knight on F2. Therefore, E3, protecting, and knight to C6. And if you notice, these two knights are coordinating an attack against this pawn, so they are working in concert. They are going to win this pawn back. There are some small interesting things we want to notice that one, we as black now have to get the pawn back because at any point white can play h3 attacking this knight and if this knight cannot capture on e5, then it will be a positional disaster for black. So white has at their disposal the option of forcing us to capture this pawn. Instead of allowing that, we will do it willingly at the most opportune moment. So let's reverse this, let's mirror it, and look at Karpov Kasparov 1985, game 16 again. Do you remember? How the game went. e4, c5, knight f3, e6, d4, c takes d, knight takes, knight c6, knight b5, d6, c4, the Maroxi bind, knight f6, knight c3, a6, Knight goes back to a3 and d5. c takes d. e takes. e takes d. And here we have knight to b4 again. Can you see what is similar? Can you also see the difference? It's not only that this is mirrored. It is also that this knight on a3 that Karpov used 100 years of established chess theory to say, this is okay, I can put my knight here, I can waste all this time because I have the Maroxi bind. Is there a hidden weakness of this knight? And there is. You cannot kick this knight. You cannot play a3 and force it to capture. And that makes all the difference. In game 12, when Kasparov had first tried this gambit, this is now known as the Kasparov gambit, by the way, Karpov had tried to hang on to the pawn and play very conserv conservatively with bishop c4. He had, of course, prepared an improvement over that and played bishop to e2 saying oh you can take the pawn back because i will have a huge lead in development knight on b takes d5 and i play bishop f3 
we are equal on material and I have a huge lead in development. But Kasparov did not take the pawn. He did something that confused Karpov a great deal. He played bishop c5 instead. Kasparov has since revealed that this is one of the deepest parts of preparation he had ever done at that point. He had more than 20 moves from this here position prepared in his memory. He was so excited. And what did he do? He got the move order wrong. And that is why Karpov was so confused. This move is not the correct move to play right now because white can neutralize black's advantage with bishop to e3. But human chess is a psychological game as well as a science. And this small inaccuracy confused Karpov just enough that he made a small inaccuracy himself and castled. Very rarely is it a mistake to castle in chess. And this allowed Kasparov to get back into his preparation via transposition. He also castled. And now Karpov says, bishop to f3, if you're not going to capture that pawn, then I will make it impossible. Knight defends the pawn, bishop defends the pawn, queen defends the pawn. And Kasparov says, I don't want your pawn, and plays bishop to f5. This is one of the star moves of the game, because it shows what the whole point is, since you're not going to be able to force me to recapture. I am going to refuse to ever recapture with that knight, and I will infiltrate. I will use this knight to infiltrate your position. I will build myself an outpost in the midst of White's kingdom, and I will completely stifle your development. This bishop move attacks c2 in concert with the knight, meaning that this really horrible knight on a3 is not able to get back. It will be captured. Even more importantly, this bishop attacks d3. Watch out for d3. Karpov plays bishop g5. What is it about? It, it creates what is known as a pin. The bishop pins the knight to the queen, meaning that if the knight moves, the bishop can capture the queen. Why is that so important in this position? It's because the positional strength, the strategical power of this bishop on f5 is enormous. By locking this knight in place, Karpov makes sure that it is not really defending on e4, and that allows him to later play bishop e4. The knight cannot capture, only the bishop can capture, and then it can be recaptured by the knight on c3, and Karpov will be very, very, very happy if he can exchange this bishop for this bishop, because without this bishop, this knight is n worth nothing. And if this knight is not a lot better than this knight, well, then this pawn will be decisive. You do not go down a pawn against Anatoly freaking Karpov without very, very serious compensation. You lose that game if you don't have that compensation. Young Gary Kasparov, only 22 years old, plays rook from f8 to e8, recognizing that he needs to be able to capture with something else than the bishop on e4 if white plays bishop e4. Queen d2 in response by Karpov, getting ready to activate the rooks so he will have full development of his pieces. In chess, you want to have all your friends to the party, and that is what he is doing. He's playing positional chess, 
and he wants to use every single one of his resources to the maximum effect. Pawn to b5. This knight here is looking worse and worse. Have you ever heard a knight on the rim is dim? That's something we say in chess. Why? Because a knight on the rim of the board attacks way fewer squares. The knight does not have the same sort of symmetry of movement as say the rook or the bishop. If it is on the side of the board, it simply loses options. This knight has four legal squares it can go to. One, two, three, four. That's half of eight. Why do I say that? You will see. You will see. And it is about this move here. What does it do? Here it is. Rook from A to D1, creating what is known in chess as a battery of the rook and queen supporting each other on this D file. And here it is. Knight D3. Will you look at that? Just clogging up all of white's activity, making this queen and this rook look very clumsy indeed. Why did Kasparov though, why did he need to play b5 first? Because after he has played b5, knight to d3 now comes with a very, very dangerous threat of pawn to b4, creating what is known as a fork, you can see two pins on the fork, attacks this knight and this knight you can only save one and obviously if you lose a knight for only a mere pawn you are going to lose that game. And that means that one of these knights will have to move. It cannot be this because it looks after this pawn here so therefore knight on a3 to b1. Do you remember how I talked about the knights and which way they were facing. This knight on her sister's starting square is facing the wrong way. So this knight went from g1, f3, d4, b4, a3, back to b1. It's a long journey for a knight just to replace her sister on the starting square. Kasparov starts to turn the screws. h6 attacking the bishop, challenging it on this strong diagonal. The bishop has to drop back in order to maintain the pin on the knight, so it goes to h4. Now let's turn our attention to the other side of the board and turn the screws there, pawn to b4, attacking this other knight, knight to a4. Look at these knights. Where did Kasparov get his insight from? How did he know that by making these knights bad, he can make white's position crumble? If you want to understand that, look at a game between Karpov with the white pieces and Wolfgang Unziger, played some 10 years before this game, where Karpov used this exact positional concept to absolutely crush Unziger. That was the game that brought a then very young Karpov onto the map. That was the first game in which we really saw his genius and he went on to dominate chess for 10 years from that game. But now he's the old one and chess is a battle of ideas and how is it really with ideas? If the environment in which they grow is healthy, new ideas will be created from the knowledge and insight gained by the old ideas, they will be refined, fine-tuned and maybe turned on their heads or used in a different way to push us further. I believe that this is not only true in chess. So Karpov is getting a taste of his own medicine here, his own medicine 2.0 we could say. The knight, however terrible it is, does attack the bishop on the c5. The bishop will have to move. It goes to d6. Happy to see this. 
Karpov plays bishop g3, wanting to exchange the two dark squared bishops. Let's get rid of them. Let's, in general, he's saying, get rid of as many pieces as possible. Why? Because he is up what we call material. He has more soldiers on the battlefield. And if you are attacking somebody with a hundred soldiers and you have a hundred and one soldier, that difference is not very big. But if they pick each other off one by one, you will end up with two soldiers against one soldier. And that is a big difference. Unperturbed, Kasparov plays rook to c8, completing his awesome development. Every single piece is being used to an extreme degree. It is so effective how these pieces just absolutely control this board. The rooks are looking at these open files. Best place a rook can possibly be, but it is even better because this knight that cannot be captured because it's protected by this bishop controls c1 and controls e1. So you cannot play any rook to any of these squares. They will be captured. You cannot challenge the domination of these two rooks. Karpov needs to do something. He plays pawn to b3. Why? Because this knight needs a future and it has nowhere to go. Cannot go here, cannot go here, cannot go here. But now it can go here. That is unless Kasparov have something to say about it because he does not want to see knight b1 knight c4. That would cost him the game if Karpov was allowed to do that. So what does he do? And he does what grandmasters very often do. They address a threat on one side of the board by doing something on the other side of the board. And sometimes the real challenge for us mortals, us chess fans, is to figure out the connection of what's happening on one side of the board to what's happening on the other side of the board. Kasparov plays g5. There is a lot going on here. But basically, what this move does is it says, I want to put my queen on f6, where my queen can see b1. If my queen can see b1, I will attack it twice with the knight and the queen, and I will then not be able to play your knight to b1. How does that work? First, let's consider the e4 square, an extremely important square, extremely hotly contested, the knight, the bishop, and the rook all attacking this square. It is of paramount importance for white that if Kasparov ever plays knight to e4, that he will be able to play bishop takes knight. Because this knight is simply too good. You can say, oh, can't I just capture this knight here because the knight, the knight blocks, but the knight can capture the bishop on g3 with a discovered check simultaneously defending the bishop. So this will end very, very badly for white. And g5 threatens to play g4. Cannot be captured very, very well defended this. And if the bishop has to go back to e2, then we will see the devastating effect of knight e4. Therefore, Karpov chooses the best way to go about this. Bishop takes bishop on d6. This is recaptured immediately by the queen. And then g3 by Karpov. And how, how did this really work? Well, when the bishop was on g3, there was no way you could play g3. So we made this exchange so that the bishop here on f3 can go to g2, where it can still see e4 very well. But what does that have to do 
with B1. Here it comes. Knight D7. Notice, notice that knight takes on D5 is possible. He could win back the pawn. And he's saying, no, no. I am playing knight to D7. Kasparov says, he says, I have made this pawn so bad that I am not going to capture it because it is worse than nothing. It is a disadvantage for you, my esteemed opponent. It is a disadvantage for you that you even have this soldier on the board. Knight on d7, going backwards, isn't black attacking. Well, black really is attacking because knight e5 is coming, looking at f3. That is what we call a knight maneuver. And here is a chess word, prophylaxis. It means reacting to your opponent's threat before it appears on the board. The term was coined by Aron Nimsovich from Riga, who is actually buried in Denmark, where I live. And Karpov used this concept to play bishop g2, reacting to the threat of knight e5 before it even appeared on the board. But all of this, all of this was just a way for Kasparov to forcefully, very forcefully, make white dance after his pipe so that he can play queen f6 and queen on f6 attacks on b1. So this knight will not get out. Now that is chess, ladies and gentlemen. All because of this monster knight. Do you know what they call such a knight now? After the concept was introduced in this game, they called it an octopus knight. Why? Because most octopodes, which I believe actually is the correct plural of octopus, not octopi, that's a totally different discussion, but most octopodes, they have eight legs or arms, eight arms. This one here, four. This one here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is an absolute monster octopus knight. Karpov has to get out of this. He plays a3. If he can draw the match, he retains his title. Kasparov can only become world champion by taking it from him. And Karpov is not about to let go. A3 attacks B4. If we are allowed to capture here, we will create escape squares from this knight. Kasparov does something really simple. He just says, the pawn is attacked, I will defend the pawn. And he plays a5, so that a takes b is sufficiently adequately met by a takes b, like so. And now, what is Karpov going to do with his extra pawn that is just cramping his development? What move is he going to play? Let's introduce a new chess term, Zugzwang. Isn't that a nice word? It's German, Zugzwang. It means being forced to move. And it is a very delicate concept in chess, where what you do is that you make a position that is orchestrated in such a way that, is, that it is a disadvantage for the opponent to have the move because you cannot waive the right to move in chess. You have to make a move on every turn. And what Kasparov has done here is he had made a virtual Sukhswang position where Karpov, the great Anatoly Karpov, doesn't have any good moves. He can only make his position worse. Absolutely incredible. He plays queen a2. Look at that queen. 
this where, where can it go it has it can it cannot go here it will be captured by the pawn it cannot go here it will be captured by the knight it cannot go here it will be captured by the rook it cannot go here captured by the other rook and this is supposed to be the most powerful piece on the chessboard and here kasparov must have savored this moment he played bishop back to g6 a move that does almost nothing it improves his position ever so slightly the bishop is no long, longer blocking the queen's attack on f2 that's a small improvement the bishop is now defended by a pawn also a very small improvement but what it is more than anything is just giving back the move to white saying what are you gonna do disgusted with his position cup of place d6 saying go ahead please i beg of you capture that pawn no no kasparov may capture that pawn but it will be exactly when he chooses and he does it again he plays pawn to g4 again a move that does almost nothing almost but it does improve his position a little bit a tiny smidge and that is a luxury he has that is something he can do contrast that with white white cannot do that what Karpov played on this move was queen back to d2 so what has he done the last couple of moves move desperately tried to give a pawn away for nothing and moving his queen back and forth he Karpov is saying can you please capture the pawn on d6 i can then come in and capture the pawn on h6 nah kasparov again just a small small move extremely patient i could learn from that he plays king to g7 protecting h6 and here i'd like to ask you what uh, metal is is the, is the best metal what is which is the most uh, valuable is it silver is it bronze is it gold or is it fine gold I think fine gold is the most valuable metal and Ben fine gold grandmaster Ben fine gold he says never play f3 whatever you do never play f3 Anatoly Karpov played f3 in this position this is pure desperation he's trying to open up this rook against the queen he wants to capture here on g5 and at this moment Kasparov said all right I'll take the pawn Queen takes on d6 he's still going to be a pawn down if takes g4 but why is it that Grandmaster Ben Feingold says that you should never play f3 it exposes the king Queen d4 because there is no pawn on f2 this is check king h1 let's get this knight into the game knight to f6 where is it going it is going to e4 to attack the queen karpov plays rook g3 attacking the queen and this is this is him saying that this knight is so good that he is willing if the circumstances are correct to give up his queen for a mere knight this is how it works knight e4 this breaks temporarily breaks the protection from this bishop to this knight on d3 allowing queen takes d3 so the knight the knight that served kasparov so well in this game finally leaves the board but it it will cost white 
it will cost white dearly. Knight f2, check to the king. It's protected, okay, rook takes. Two knights have now left the battlefield, but bishop takes queen on d3. So two knights for a queen, but at least the dreaded octopus knight has left the battlefield and Karpov can now play rook on f to d2, pinning this bishop, meaning that this bishop cannot move because then we will get the queen. And three pieces for a queen, that's fair. That's how strong the queen, the queen is. She is like three minor pieces. Now here, Kasparov could play rook e3, just defending the bishop and just having an extremely good position. He can win this. He has this. He has it in the bag. In 1985, Garry Kasparov was only 22 years old. And we had only seen glimpses of the absolute aesthetic beauty in his games that would allow him to dominate the world of chess for the next 20 years until he retired in 2005, still being the highest rated chess player and the most winning chess player in history. So yeah, sure, he could play rook e3. But shouldn't we just sacrifice some pieces for a more perfect, quicker and more effective way of winning the game? How about queen e3, allowing rook takes d3, so that Kasparov in this position could have the satisfaction of playing rook c1, saying, oh yeah, you can capture my queen, because it's protected by the rook. So I can capture with check. You have to interpose. You can either interpose, of course, the rook. I will capture that. And then you will have to interpose the bishop. I will capture that. This is all check. Then the king moves and I capture the knight. I'm going to capture all of your pieces. So you cannot capture the queen. So he had the satisfaction of sacrificing his queen, but it wasn't possible to capture it. Instead, Karpov played knight and finally was allowed to play that move knight back to b2 defends the rook but quite simply queen f2 threatening nasty business here on e1 knight d2 and here we have the finish of the game rook takes rook that's check knight takes rook finally was able to do something but rook to e1 is check and that is going to be checkmate so karpov resigned the game let me show you the checkmate knight blocks the check rook takes the knight check bishop takes the rook and queen takes the bishop checkmating the white king. Now, that was a game of chess. I hope you had an amazing time. I hope you relaxed. I hope you appreciated the beauty of this game. If you want to support the channel, you can either buy this chess set. There is a link in the description for World Chess. These are pieces are hand carved. It is a world championship chess set, meaning that this is the design that they play the world championships on very fittingly. Also, you can consider helping me out on Patreon, patreon.com slash ASMR chess. But above all of that, I just hope that you had a good time and I really hope that I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.